our attentions, many people's attention to look into these problems, uh, to look into the questions about the groundwater contributions, how much fresh water discharged to the ocean through the underground systems. Yes. Uh, so, you know, our measurements at the beach, very localized, but ultimately related to that big questions, uh, big questions that concerning the global hydrological cycle. You know, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host Alan Sakian. We are on site at the beautiful Westlake University in Hangzhou, China. We are now going to be talking about environmental hydrology. We have Dr. Ling Li joining us on the show. Hi, Ling. Hi, Alan. Thank you so much for coming on our show. Really appreciate it. Pleasure. I'm so excited for this episode. For those who don't know Ling's background, he's professor in environmental hydrology at Westlake University School of Engineering, focused on mathematical modeling of complex environmental systems. And you can find the links in the bio below. All right, Ling, let's start things off with one of our favorite questions we like asking our guests. What are your thoughts on the direction of our world? <laughs> it's such a big question. So I don't even know um, where to start. But I read, you know, quite a few news um, articles about um, the big event uh, around the world now uh, on BBC um, reports about the global. Um, warming discussions in the UN summit. But prior to that, they were very, very serious uh, uh, protests uh, around the world by the young people. Um, and of course, this is quite related to my research work. Um, climate change has always been um, kind of the drive for what do we do um, so, in a way, um, I was very pleased to see it, um, but I think the world has been undergoing changes, very rapid changes, um, changes I'm not sure all for good, um, and of course in China that, that you know, uh, those changes occur to uh, a much greater extent, also at a much um, faster uh, pace. Um, I often um, get asked about what I think about China's and development, and even in the scientific research areas, and I use the word fast always. Um, so, you know, that rapid development around the world, uh, I would say, has put so much pressures on our resources um, and our environment as a whole. Um, climate change is becoming more and more evident. Uh, there is there is a consensus, uh, I would say, not just within the scientific community, but also um, in the general public, that this is becoming a big challenge, uh, perhaps the biggest we're facing now, the whole humanity. And, and, uh, and, and, and so you ask me about the directions of the world, I reckon, um, we are facing this challenge, we have to um, do something about it. Um, my research, uh, looking at these uh, hydrological processes in various systems, uh, has a lot to do with climate change. And in many ways, we aim to uh, look for ways to um, better assess the impact and look for ways 
uh, of dealing with the impact, mitigations or self-adaptations of the systems. Yes. Uh, Yes, just yesterday we were talking to Ketchin on the show about sustainable industrialization and circular economics. And this is why I love Westlake. There's so many of these different components tackling it from a bioengineering and sustainability standpoint, tackling it from an environmental hydrological standpoint, which we're going to unpack today on the show. I really appreciate the focus on taking care of this planet that sustains us. That's, that's such an important, critical part of our life. So how about when you were a kid and how you even got interested in the environment, how you got interested in science? What were those main um, in impact factors that got you interested? It was almost accidental, I would say. Um, I mean, what I had in my mind about environmental science and engineering um, was quite ecological. Um, I like math and I like physics um, and I had an idea that the degree program um, I chose uh, and that was offered at Tsinghua University, a top engineering university in China. I thought the program was oriented uh, towards ecology. Uh, more than pollution uh, problems uh, we, we, uh, we did uh, or I end up doing uh, a lot. Um, so um, somehow, um, you know, I went to the program with that idea, um, but it turned out the program wasn't like that at all. Um, uh, I initially lost a little bit of interest um, in my study uh, with a big focus on the design of water treatment plants and so on. Uh, of course, it's, it's very important and um, it's a major research field uh, you know, in in uh, in environmental engineering, um, but you can see my um, pursuit of that interest uh, to look at um, ecosystem uh, has been ongoing. So the work I'm doing now, physical, you know, processes and and so on. Uh, has a lot to do with the eco health of the environment. So um, ultimately, I want to see how um, water maintain, um, you know, the 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 ecosystems and how um, the degradation of a coastal wetland may be linked to the change of the uh, flow regimes, uh, uh, it may uh, be linked to sea level rise, uh, uh, but of course through uh, the modifications of perhaps um, um, the, the flow and salt transport uh, or the flow uh, and change of um, soil conditions uh, such as aeration conditions. Um, which will affect the plant growth and distributions and so on in a coastal wetland. Um, so let's jump into this. So mm -hmm. this is big for us to understand because we don't typically think about the ocean land interface and interactions being something that we want to dive deeper into studying. Many people just walk on the beach, but they don't actually think about how the ocean and land interface in a very complex way right at that region and how the hydrological cycle deals with, with that. So 
over the last 20 or so years, um, you post, you know, you did your PhD at the University of Western Australia, and then you've been um, specifically, a lot of your time has been at the University of Queensland since 2002 to 2018, so 16 years, and you were being, um, doing senior lecturing and also then um, pr professing um, directly starting in 2005. Mm -hmm. Okay, so during that time, you, um, we're really deep in working on this submarine groundwater discharge and that incorporates oscillating groundwater flow and the circulation driven by tides and waves. So let's start talking about this complex um, uh, environmental ecosystem and how exactly you've spent the last couple of decades just diving deep into understanding that and what can be um, uh, especially what can what we can take away as like a big picture understanding of what's actually happening mm -hmm. well you mentioned you know the beach environment um, uh, which we go to right, and enjoy uh, enjoy our time there um, but it's true a lot of the time we wouldn't go to the beach to think about um, the groundwater system underneath at all um, and yet, you know, you experience uh, waves, um, uh, these oceanic oscillations, they are clearly um, uh, visible. Uh, and in fact, that's part of the fun right, we have at the beach. Um, and yet, for um, groundwater researchers, um, for long, we have uh, pretty much uh, overlook uh, the impact uh, of these uh, oceanic oscillations on the groundwater system. Um, so uh, the classic, classical view of groundwater flow um, in the coastal aquifer um, is based on the assumptions uh, of aesthetic sea levels uh, with these oscillations neglected completely. Uh, we, we looked into this um, starting from uh, 2006 with a PhD student project. We measured um, the groundwater flow in the intertidal zone of a beach in a great detail um, involving um, measurements of hydraulic head conditions, salinity distributions over many tidal cycles uh, with the tidal oscillations uh, resolved. So that means uh, the measurements were taken at a relatively uh, high frequency. Intratidal signals uh, were measured. Uh, and from that, uh, we uh, pick up of course, uh, groundwater responses to the tidal oscillations, uh, but more importantly, it's the time average effect that we're showing clearly in the measurements, meaning when you average the groundwater flow, um, there is a residual current um, in the result uh, that indicate the tide not only induces oscillations of groundwater flow, it produces um, a persistent flow uh, that drives groundwater circulating through the upper uh, intertidal zone near the beach surface. Yes. Uh, and of course, in terms of salinity measurement, uh, we uh, found uh, the presence of a high uh, salinity zone, uh, which we call upper saline zone. Uh, the importance of this very localized phenomenon, uh, this features of the system, is that it can potentially control um, the exit conditions of a transport pathway for fresh groundwater, but also for what's in that fresh groundwater. Right? A lot of materials coming from the land, uh, largely in the solute form. Uh, so this, this is um, 
this this localized phenomenon uh, has an implications uh, for the determinations of uh, fresh water discharge, but also for uh, fluxes of chemicals that are derived from the land, because um, you know groundwater and ocean waters. They're very different waters, right? So uh, one, for example, has very low oxygen content, and that's groundwater, and the other, ocean water, has relatively high uh, oxygen content. The two mix uh, will create conditions um, for uh, reactions, for chemical reaction. Uh, a lot of chemicals in a reduced form in groundwater come in, in contact with oxygenated seawater um, can get oxidized. Uh, for example, you know, we, we were talking about uh, ferrocyne um, being oxidized uh, to ferric iron and, and precipitate. Uh, so, you know, a lot of um, reactions can take place because of the mixings uh, induced by uh, the tightly uh, driven flows, uh, and of course, uh, you know, this enhanced dispersions of as well. Yes, let's also then um, dive into you know the last um, since now it's been since October of 2018, joining Westlake University as a professor of environmental hydrology, and now having. Uh, seven full-time researchers here at Westlake, and you still have students and research fellows at the University of Queensland as well. And I actually really enjoyed this understanding of how you're probing that ocean land interface and interactions because you actually go and do field trips. This is a very fun part to science. I love this part. <laughs> uh, this is such a beautiful part. You it's guys, almost like a holiday it on is, the beach. It's a holiday yeah. for you guys. For environmental hydrologists, their, yeah. work, their field trip is literally to the beach. Yeah, yeah, that's so great. Well, you know, the field work I show you, right, um, was done by my students and, and they had three weeks uh, at a beach side near a resort, and and I think for them it was it was a holiday, but it was a holiday of a lot of hard work. Yes, yeah. and let's talk about what exactly people will see here in this image that we'll have embedded. You guys have what are these rods that are inside of? the sand, how and what are they measuring with this ocean land um, interface? So, um, um, you know, they are, sorry, they were uh, a set of um, uh, sensors we put in uh, through these uh, PVC pipes um, uh, and they were also samplers uh, that are inserted to different dabs of the beach sand uh, within these uh, PVC pipes. Um, so for the sensors, we measure uh, the pore water pressures, uh, we measure um, also the salinity, we measure, um, uh, for some sensors, we were also measuring uh, dissolve oxygens um, and in the same time we measure uh, in the same time we also sample sample waters for direct measurement of these uh, these uh, uh, you know physical physiochemical parameters mm -hmm. uh, uh, including even pH um, and the aim is to look at uh, the flow, uh, the hydraulic uh, head can be determined based on uh, the measurement of the pore water pressures uh, and of course uh, the, the complexity here is that the salinity has to be uh, combined uh, in the calculations, has to be combined with um, the, the, uh, the pressures uh, uh, because gravity here 
uh, is an important drive uh, of the flow, but then gravity uh, uh, exists in an environment with variable density. Uh, now it's it's a bit technical, but uh, I guess um, you can think of buoyancy force uh, as perhaps the analogy here. Right? If you have different density, of course um, the, the, the force balance would be different. Right? Um, and therefore in the calculation of the hydraulic head, the density effect has to be uh, taken into account. Uh, nevertheless, with the pressure measurements and the, the salinity, we can calculate the hydraulic head. Um, the gradient of the hydraulic head will indicate the flow, uh, the groundwater flow. In this case, of course, uh, it could be just pour water, mixed pour water uh, with both fresh water and, and sea water involved. Uh, and the salinity measurement is not trivial. Uh, using um, electrical conductivity probe sometimes requires a lot of calibrations in that environment. Uh, and DO measurement is also not trivial. Uh, remember, this is in the sand, right? Uh, a lot of these probes, they are built for clear water. So uh, indeed, in the pipe, we had to, um, you know, design uh, a measurement chambers uh, at different depths again, uh, in order to uh, measure the representative uh, local salinity, uh, dissolved oxygens uh, fairly accurately. Um, and of course, to ensure uh, the in situ measurements using these uh, sensor, these probes, we also sample water uh, for independent measurements to validate the, the measurements, uh, the data of, uh, of these sensors collected by these sensors. Um, and the measurement were taken over a tidal periods. In fact, I think we did it for uh, for one particular field campaign, we actually um, uh, took the measurement over a period of uh, three weeks, covering the spring and neap cycle. So, very intensive, very intensive. Uh, yes. But then, these measurements provide a pictures of how uh, you know the local flow processes involved in recycling uh, sea waters and then fresh water discharge, uh, the discharge of um, water coming from the land to the oceans and even um, circulations of sea water in the lower salt water wet, mm. driven by the density gradients, uh, how these three different kind of flow regimes interact. Yeah. Yeah, so I think it's necessary and in, indeed our measurement, our initial measurement, this, um, you know, involving a lot of uh, hard work uh, at the end, kind of provide the pictures uh, of that complex uh, uh, groundwater flow systems. Yes. Yeah. Yes, I like how you call this a global hydrological cycle that's happening. I like how you showed me this really good um, GIF that was being in, that we can embed here, where it's as though when the two meet this ocean land interface, there's so much complexity happening there, and you can you can simulate out what the tide from the ocean is doing to that ocean land relationship. And you can, you can see how there's this, there's the formation of this saline plume mm -hmm. that occurs. And you can see how there's this meeting, this meeting zone of the fresh water that meets the ocean water mm -hmm. and the complex geo, bio geochemical reaction that's occurring right there and that zone. 
and how even further there's also this other really cool asset that you were showing me that we can embed here where there's a there's the relationship of these these groundwater aquifers that also interplay at these ocean land interfaces where there's actually an and even small earthquakes have a lot to deal with the way that the, the, the fractures occur from the aquifers that enable the groundwater to come up. Deep aquifers, that's deep, what we're talking about. Deep aquifers. Yep. Yeah. And how it, 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 it's so fascinating how it literally, it, it, you also taught me this, this phrase, catchment hydrology. Mm -hmm. And that there's these, these gorgeous, uh, like, like freshwater in uh, catchment plumes that occur in normally like completely sa more saline a saline area areas yeah. and it and the grass was called uh kogan kogan grass, grass yeah it's and a freshwater species yeah yeah so um you know uh i guess we talked about how uh, a beach groundwater system can be complicated by tide waves and lately uh, we looked at the impact of um, the temperature differences between ocean water and uh, coastal groundwaters uh, and of course um, we previously studied uh, how even the beach morphology the, the, the sh shape of the beach uh, can also influence how the groundwater flow in the near shore zone. But the complexity of the groundwater system itself is also in that um, the, the aquifer um, may involve multiple units, not just one shallow aquifer um, as we just talked about yes may not just be simply a sandy aquifer uh, with the beach has been you know the seaward boundary right underneath they may be confining aquifers confining units um, and and the confining units may be recharged um, by a remote source right, from a distant area. Um, you, you said catchment, of course, uh, it's, it's a very important concept in hydrology um, because it tells where the water uh, comes from. And quite often in catchment hydrology, when we do um, water balance, uh, we assume the groundwater system has the same, the shallow groundwater system has the same catchment as the surface water. Uh, for a lot of hydrological system or for a lot of river basin, this is possibly quite true. Um, but as I showed you, right, um, um, you know, the field site we had in the Jiangsu province um, in a reclaimed land area next to the coast, basically. North of Shanghai. North of Shanghai. That um, system clearly um, is impacted by not only um, recharge uh, from the local area, but also uh, a remote water source uh, which goes through this deep Aquifers. groundwater aquifer wow. um, with a leakage, right? Wow, that goes up into up these. wells uh, yeah. to the local surface aquifer uh, and potentially also discharged directly to the ocean as well. Yes. And that will change the traditional view. Um, hydrological view um, based on you know the classical uh, catchment water balance uh, here we talk about an additional 
water could be large amount discharged into the oceans. Yes. Um, I think it, you know. And deep aquifers and uh, catchment hydrology is one of, a, one of potentially many other complexities of the ocean land interface. Interface, yeah. The, the, um, the hydrogeology itself, it can be very complex, right? So, and, and again, that's the challenge. Um, and yet, we, we have to resolve this in order to quantify how much ground would actually discharge to the oceans. Yes. Uh, it is an important question because this affects our estimate of the return flow of water from the land to the oceans. Uh, Currently, the estimate is, is largely based on a river discharge. Uh, groundwater contribution is assumed um, to be fairly small, but Willem Moore's uh, paper published in Nature in 1996 uh, attracted our attention, many people's attention to look into these problems, uh, to look into the questions uh, about the groundwater contributions, how much fresh water uh, discharged to the ocean through the underground systems. Yes. Uh, so, you know, our measurements at the beach, very localized, but ultimately related to that big questions, uh, big questions that concerning the global hydrological cycles. Why should you care about the water cycle? The water cycle is a vital component of life. The fact that we have water on this planet that is located in just this perfect habitable zone around the star that gives us water for life is that we're made of life, that so many, that water sustains us, that we drink every single day, that the water cycle itself the hydrological cycle itself is so important for us to study to get these amounts for uh, so let's let's actually explain this exact amount so that right now it's approximated that 40,000 cubic kilometers of water is exchanged between the rivers and the ocean globally annually is an approximation but that's not taking into account the groundwater that could, these deep aquifers, all of these other potential styles of ocean land interface. Mm -hmm. And so for us to get the true picture of that aspect of our water cycle is a critical way for us to realize the planet that we actually live in and on and how if we get a more clear understanding of our reality, that's one of the most important things for us to do in yeah. science. Uh, yeah, I think your interpretation is actually fairly um, accurate, uh, almost ac accurate. Um, um, the 40,000 cubic um, kilometers uh, as the annual amount um, um, of the water exchange between land and oceans, um, the estimate is largely based on river discharge, uh, assuming the groundwater contribution is uh, is small. But I think it is an open question as to how much, uh, you know, uh, water uh, is returned from the land to the ocean through the groundwater system. Uh, still not resolved. Uh, and it's important to have a good constraint on that uh, figure. Uh, I think we need to know more accurately uh, what is the amount of water exchange between the land and oceans. Uh, because it is the amount of water vapor flux, the net flux from the ocean to, uh, from over oceans to over land. Uh, roughly it's, it's, it's a large percentage, it's 35% uh, of the uh, precipitation on the continent. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine, um, you know, what we see 
uh, in the river, uh, what we see in the catchment, uh, you know, is quite driven by that flux. So we need to know how much it is uh, more accurately. At the moment, uh, as already mentioned, the estimate is only based on river discharge. It, water is also, um, well, water vapor is a greenhouse gas. Um, water vapor transport provides a key uh, feedback mechanism for the climate, uh, for the climate change and hydrological cycle uh, changes. And therefore, it, it is also uh, for that reason we need to quantify the net flux more accurately. Um, because potentially, you know, if we underestimate uh, this flux, uh, you can see that it means we have underestimated uh, the role played by water vapor at a very large scale, the global scale, right? Yeah. So perhaps that also means we have underestimated the feedback played by water vapors uh, as a way either to uh, uh, modify the climate systems, uh, both in terms of positive or negative feedbacks. Uh, you know, for a lot of reason, we really need to uh, have a better, uh, a better estimate of uh, this net flux, water exchange between the land and oceans. Yes. Uh, especially the net fluxes. Yeah. I'm surprised by how small of a volume the hydrological cycle right now is predicted to be compared to the entire volume of the Earth. Of the Earth. Okay, but, but water mainly exists on just in the in this, uh, let's say, surface areas yeah. uh, or near surface areas yeah. above and below. Yeah. So, so then, and the, that's also where uh, all the life forms. Um, okay. So let, the majority of the life forms exist. Exactly. So let's let's put it this way: the surface of the planet being seventy percent water and thirty percent land, or so. And if you just take into account just the surface of the planet, I believe 40,000 cubic kilometers is actually pretty substantial in comparison to just the surface. As in 40,000 cubic kilometers being a part of the hydrological cycle annually, is actually quite a bit regarding just the surface. You, like, can do a, you can do a conversion of that. So if we divide that volume uh, uh, by the surface uh, area, oh, you get let's, some let's kind of that. equivalent either uh, evaporation or precipitations, and then perhaps we can see how uh, so it would be somewhere around one... But, but let's, one let, let me give you uh, another way of looking at the significance of that figure. That 40,000 cubic kilometers of water is equivalent, very close to, 35% of the precipitations on the continent. Yes, you said which that is, figure. Which is which very, is, very it's large. Important. That's a very yeah. important figure. Um, just to make sure that this point is being communicated because it's such a profound one. So, okay, the Earth's volume is over a trillion cubic kilometers, but I'm not sure what percent of that volume is on the surface. Let's just say only 5%, maybe, or even less it of the volume on, is it on the surface. It depends on probably what you... Uh, well, what you define as the near surface, let's near say, surface, near surface near area, surface. Right? If it is, uh, I guess I said... Five kilometers I guess or ten. Five, okay, five, five or, or ten, ten above and below. Yes, okay. Um, 
we can, I guess, some calculation will have, would it be, <laughs> we'll have to Would do. it be 95% or 99% is located in the actual uh, inner mantle and outer mantle core? Cool, yeah. Yeah. And cool. even even the deep uh, crust. Shell, crust, deep, yeah. Deep, deep crust. Okay. Yeah, deep so, crust. okay. So, that, so let's, let's just say, and someone can help us in the comments below and tell us about these numbers. But let's just say that it's somewhere around 95 or 99 percent of the volume. Yeah. Okay. So, I ran the calculation a trillion divided by 95 or so is 10 billion. So it's still significant. Even if it's 99, if you're dividing yeah, by 99, yeah, it's still yeah. 10 billion. So then 10 billion of the kilometers, cubic kilometers of the planet are located on the surface or uh, the edge surface yeah. area. I think the volume comparison uh, is not very meaningful and it might even because be, it might if even you look be at higher. yeah if you well i mean even if it is i think it is still oh. small uh, but this ratio doesn't mean much at all uh, when you look at the hydrological processes for example um, uh, you know flow overland flow and then to the rivers generating flood and so on um, all these processes happen essentially on the land surface. So then how do you calculate the volume of that area, right? Uh, it, it, it's a very small volume. What, what I'm saying is, if you look at what happened um, on the land surface uh, as, as the key hydrological processes, right? When you have rainfall taking place, it generate overland flow, uh, flow that take the water to the rivers. Um, and then of course, water flowing the rivers, uh, which might generate uh, floods and so on, right? This, all these processes occur uh, on the land surface, essentially, right? within a very, very small volume of space. Yes. So the volume comparison, I think it's not particularly useful. Of course, you can argue that, um, you know, uh, the, the activity take place uh, not just on the land surface, there will be water going through the soil and, and reach the groundwater, and then, you know, somehow there will be some flow activity also underneath. And of course, um, you know, you also uh, can think about uh, the rain um, as a process, rainfall and precipita uh, rainfall, uh, and also evaporation as a process that takes place in the atmosphere as well. Um, but remember, at the end, right, the, 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 the key processes occur on the land surface. Yes. So I don't think the volume <laughs> comparison is particularly yeah. uh, meaningful. Uh, it is very true that uh, this large amount of water exchange uh, drive the major uh, hydrological processes on the land surface, yes. uh, which is what you see happening in the rivers, uh, in the catchments, um, everywhere at different scales as well. Yes. So, yes. yeah, it yes. is important. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. This was actually really enlightening for me to dive into that and hopefully for other people as well because we typically don't think of the diameter of the planet, the volume of the planet. We don't typically think about what amount of the uh, the volume of the planet is actually only along the land uh, surface as well as the ocean um, volume and then we don't think about what volume is moved in the hydrological cycle uh, globally annually either and so these things are very interesting to try and picture what 40,000 cubic kilometers looks like that's moving in a hydrological cycle across the, the planet every single year and these are all very interesting ways of perceiving something that just seems to be 
uh, not important, but is actually critical to understanding our ecology. So there's, of course, like you were explaining as well, all of the other components that actually go into um, environmental hydrology and understanding the ocean land relationship is in the interface is so cool and how you guys go on the field trips to be able to start analyzing this is so neat. I really want you to also explain how there's more to this that meets the eye again. So when we look at, at dams, so we had this example with that we were talking about earlier before we started with the Three Gorges Dam in China which I believe is, was, was producing the most energy out of all the dams on, in the planet and was recently replaced by one that borders uh, Brazil and Panama. Mm -hmm. um, and so, I mean, and the numbers are crazy, 100 terawatt hours per year. Wow. And so we don't typically think about how when you put a dam down, how it affects the ecology of the area. And so, Teach us about how putting a dam here in China at the Yangtze River, how that created environmental hydrological changes. Okay. Now, uh, building a dam um, can potentially also affect uh, the processes at the ocean land interface. Yes. Because um, the flow will be modified by the dam uh, operation as well. Um, but we haven't really looked into uh, that effect yet. Um, I was involved in a project looking at how Three Gorges Dam operation may influence uh, wetland systems in two major lakes downstream, Dongting Lake and Poyang Lake. Uh, so, um, the operation of the dam um, involving uh, different dis discharge um, patterns or manipulation of the river discharge prior to and after the rain season um, can regulate, uh, cause significant changes of the flow in the rivers downstream, uh, the two effects are these. Uh, prior to the rain season, um, the dam will discharge more water than usual to kind of empty uh, the reservoir to some extent to increase uh, its flood mitigation capacity to increase the storage. Um, and that occur, of course, prior to the rain seasons um, upstream, but that rain season comes later than the rain, the rainfall uh, downstream, downstream on the eastern side. You know, this whole area is affected by um, the Eastern Asia monsoon. Right, which comes from the Pacific. So it rains first, for example, in Poyang Lake around May or late May or June. But it, the rain affected by that monsoon system uh, takes place upstream of the Three Gorges Dams, July or late June. Uh, and therefore, this time lag um, mean when the reservoir discharge more water, this kind of overlap with heavy rainfall in the lake area of Poyang. So um, potentially the discharge can cause flooding or can worsen the flooding in the Poyang lake area. Okay, this is uh, the blocking effect we think uh, that can happen because of the regulations of the dam on the rivers. Uh, it turned out this effect is rather minor uh, based on uh, our analysis of the data, existing data. Uh, 
But the second effect is after the the rain season, the dam uh, start to store more water. So by reducing the discharge, to raise the water level in the reservoir for hydropower generations, and that means it will, you know, it will um, reduce the discharge and it will lower the river water levels. Uh, at the lake, at the lake mouth, this lowered water level in the river can induce, um, uh, can increase the drainage of the lake water to uh, the rivers, uh, causing potentially a dry conditions, a drought. Uh, we found, based on the data analysis, about a meter of uh, you know, over join or lowering of the lake water levels uh, because of that effect. So this is quite significant. Uh, this could impact on the wetland systems. Uh, in the project um, I was involved in, uh, our ecologists uh, indeed found a trend of these wetland turning into dry land. So. You know, it, it is quite uh, amazing that the impact can be so uh, visible and uh, manifested in such a way uh, in such short period of time. Uh, and, and I think it does give us a warning uh, of um, running into this kind of unexpected problems uh, uh, because of the engineering work. It happens, I think, quite often. Uh, we, we can easily overlook this impact. Uh, totally. Yeah, when we design you know, the engineering projects and, and so on. Totally. But I have to say, you know, um, the Three Gorges Dam overall, of course, has also produced positive uh, in fact, for example, the power generation you mentioned compared to burning fossil fuels. Yeah, uh, but there's a it next, just, there's a next a, step of sustainable energy advancement that we're going to get to. Yeah, yeah. Because there's significant. You can't just put a damn. This is a really again just a very important way of viewing it. We were talking about this again yesterday with Ketchin. Just you can't think that if you're going to dump wastewater into a river that it's going to have no downstream effects. Uh -huh. like you got to know that it's going to have downstream effects. Everything's interconnected. Same thing. Oh, let's build a dam here. Uh -huh. Well, it's going to have ecological and hydrological effects uh -huh. on the environment, not only at where you put the dam, but also downstream. It's uh -huh. going to have effects. And so humans thinking with this indigenous principle of seven generations out, how is my dam placement here going to affect yeah. the environment seven generations down the line? It's just a crucial way of thinking. Yeah. It, I think it goes back to almost, you know, our initial discussion about uh, what we're facing now, uh, the whole humanity, right? Things change so rapidly. We have developed all these technologies uh, that enable uh, human being to manipulate the nature so much. I mean, in the life science, we start to manipulate life. <laughs> Imagine uh, how frightening that is. Uh, but of course, um, you know, uh, let's say in, in my field, um, you know, not just the rivers, uh, but many other hydrological systems have been, uh, our coastline, for example, has been uh, modified significantly by humans. Our uh, urban development along the coast, in Australia, you know, this is perhaps um, the, 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 the worst, if I use the word, example, because uh, Eighty-five percent of the population live along the coast. Yeah. So it made most changes. Uh, that pop. That's to the nature. That statistic along me, the coastline, essentially. That statistic might be true across the planet. Yeah. 
it might be 85% of people live along coasts on the planet. Yeah, that proportion probably, yeah, is, is quite so. Um, so, you, you, I mean, you see this kind of uh, modifications by us uh, everywhere. And we, I, we literally live on the region of the world. Potentially, almost nine out of ten of us live on the region of the world that you study so damn closely, the ocean land yeah. interaction. Yeah. 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 Depending on these statistics, right, if it is that such a majority of people do live in this region, let's say eight out of 10 people live coastally um, within 60 or so miles of the coast, then it becomes even more and more important for us to become more and more vigilant and, and scientifically um, uh, Advance. advanced around our understanding of the ocean land interaction and relationship, the hydrological cycle around those areas, and uh, also how to um, decrease our fossil fuel consumption and increase our uh, sustainable industrialization so that we can solve this biggest challenge that the planet is facing around how humans are, are anthropomorph how humans are anthropogenically affecting the ecosystem that we reside in. And we you know, you've been listing all of these different ways that you're exploring this and understanding it, and I really am just like, just deeply fascinated with this as well. Will you give us um, two other thoughts that I want to ask you about? Are you know when we saw this graphic in grade school, most of us saw this water cycle graphic that you have a precipitation that occurs from the clouds and then you have the water that flows from the mountains and from the to rivers the ocean. to the ocean and then in the ocean the sunlight <clears throat> evaporate water the sunlight evaporates water which then rises and, and then, then that move to the land move to the land and it rains yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. it's such a beautiful childhood image but in a way in. it is that simple and it is that important as well like these big cycles um so um you know the net flux again is essentially um the key uh characteristic of that cycle as well. The net it's, it, flux is it's the word the you're flux, using. Yeah. The net flux is the amount globally that is being moved in the water from cycle. From over the oceans, to, yeah. From over the oceans, the net flux is, is the water cycle movement, the amount of water that's being moved from, uh, from the ocean over the land. Yeah. My goodness, 40,000 cubic kilometers yeah. right now is what we uh, think is the number and it could potentially be much more and affected by could be, could be more could be uh, more and it could but be but we don't know how much more that's and it could yeah. be affected by the um the deep aquifers and um and so many other uh aspects that we're still understanding yeah net flux what a cool Two word. <laughs> what a cool, cool word. Okay. Yeah, what a cool we use those words all the like time. <laughs> net yeah. flux. Two words. Net <laughs> flux and then water cycle of the water yeah, cycle. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. This is an important environmental hydrological concept, net flux. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I love that. This is this has been so enlightening. I want to ask you also about um, how you guys are using um, computer modeling and the mathematical modeling um, with uh, simulations and with uh, trying to see if uh, can we potentially make like a digital twin of the planet Earth and then and then see the uh, hydrological cycle happening on that digital twin and then and then run um, our calculations like throw different um, variables and situations at it and try and and unpack and um, how, how are you guys using simulations and mathematical modeling now for for my work um uh, we uh, we built uh, mathematical models uh, fairly well based uh, because these models uh, uh, are based on the actual processes, uh, so the flow processes or the mass transport involving the salinity, uh, salt, solute, uh, and for 
the scale we're looking at um, solving these models, these equations uh, is challenging, can be time consuming, but uh, it's durable. So uh, the result I show you, uh, you know, uh, was based on the field side we measured. So at that scale, I think mathematical models, uh, very well-based or process-based mathematical models um, can be developed to assist uh, our understanding, uh, our investigation of these processes uh, and the phenomena uh, and so on. But you also um, ask about how we might do this on a global scale. Uh, they are models. I tell you, they are models uh, combining um, uh, uh, atmospheric processes, uh, uh, land hydrological processes, and even uh, ocean circulations. Uh, really comprehensive models, and uh, and that uh, you know also um, uh, aiming to assist our study of uh, the hydrological cycles and so on. Uh, and of course climate change or climate uh, simulations. Uh, but these, the problem with these models um, is that um, the resolutions. Uh, it's impossible to resolve, for example, uh, the small scale processes and characteristic of the system we were looking at, uh, we are looking at, uh, and therefore these models ha have to uh, develop uh, some kind of parameterization of the small scale processes in the large scale model uh, formulations. Uh, and the question of course then is how valid uh, or how detailed the uh, the parameterization uh, need to be. Uh, for example, a lot of land surface uh, models uh, for the hydrological processes uh, are simply just based on water balance for the whole catchment. Some could even be bigger than a sub-catchment. Um, and it doesn't resolve flows in the rivers. Um, it doesn't resolve particularly the topography of the catchment and so on. It can't. Uh, computationally impossible. Um, and then, so this is the problem with the model in terms of uh, its formulations. Um, in some cases we know definitely the oversimplification um, is a problem that can't be resolved within the model itself. And then of course also to run these models, um, they are data required. Um, some of these models do uh, consider uh, different land users, um, but then of course to run these models you do need to have those data. Uh, they're not necessarily all available worldwide. Some countries um, can have good data set but some don't. Um, so at the end, what you will find is that the models, these global models, they can produce uh, some kind of prediction. Uh, of course, uh, if you uh, try to replicate uh, observations from the past, uh, you know, the model can be calibrated, but you, f you, you find, you know, often uh, the result are subjected to very large degrees of uncertainties, and that's the problem. Yeah. I think I mentioned already, um, it doesn't, uh, none of the model predict quite accurately the amount of waters, uh, you know, discharged to the ocean yeah. from the land. Uh, that is an indication of, uh, you know, problems in these models. Yeah. 
models are very useful. Uh, models are often, you know, uh, very useful tools for us to investigate these processes. But the, the challenge, of course, is to um, develop a sound model um, with enough details, uh, uh, you know, resolutions, uh, spatially and temporally, to represent the processes, uh, still within the constraint of assumptions, but nevertheless more compatible to the questions uh, being addressed. Yes. Uh, but then, as I said, models uh, need to be driven by data, uh, which can be a problem uh, in many applications of these models. Yes, we need uh, structured data for the models to be better and we also need the right computational uh, structure and resources for the proper uh, simulation process of something as complex as a hydrological system. I mean, this is going to be a massive advancement for us once we figure out how to make a digital twin of the earth and then analyze it and then be able to add specific uh, uh, tweak specific variables and see what happens or add specific phenomenon um, like the rise in parts per million of CO2, all this type of stuff, all these types of digital twin modelings of the planet. Um, a couple quick questions on the way out that we like asking our guests. How do you think we can increase collaboration around our world? To me, collaboration uh, happens almost quite naturally. Um, I think, you know, we may be assisted uh, by good policies uh, from uh, funding bodies, um, uh, from the universities, and of course at the national levels, uh, good agreement between countries and so on. But I would say, uh, you know, science is something that connects people uh, and enable them to collaborate almost by its own power. Yeah. That's what I mean by naturally. Um, but I would say good policies uh, will enable people to do that better. And at Westlake, um, collaboration is part of uh, what we do. Um, is, is everything, basically, uh, uh, starting with uh, very, very active uh, um, communication uh, among ourselves. We talk to each other all the time, exchanging ideas, uh, um, yes. and, and of course, uh, you know, discussing our work and so on. Uh, and that enable within Westlake very cross-disciplinary approach to thinking, identifying the problems, and to formulating approaches to, uh, to addressing these problems and carrying out the research, the actual research. Uh, I mentioned this news and idea session yeah. uh, chaired by Professor Tianxi. Uh, it's, it's, it's a fantastic mechanism. And at Westlake, we also have good policies to encourage, uh, you know, staff members to collaborate, not only within ourselves but also with people outside. Yeah. Um, it has a lot to do with evaluations of the performance. Uh, you know, these uh, these days, uh, university and then individuals uh, are so driven by metrics. Uh, uh, for measuring uh, the performance of academic. Uh, these are not particularly good. And in China, sometimes we try to be so accurate um, in allocating uh, you know, the credit to people uh, in the research that we have to um, decide only the first author or the corresponding author will take the credit and no one else. That's clearly not very helpful for collaboration. <laughs> so at Westlake, we, we don't care about that at all. We can double 
or we can triple count the credit. I think that's the way to go. Um, yeah. yeah. Especially since on all of these advancements in our world, the burden of genius that has been associated with the advancement of our healthcare advancements or any technological advancements, quantum mechanics, whatever it is, that it's not like just some first author. There's 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 a tremendous amount of people that were part that partook in that advancement. Plus, um, there may be some sort of like a first author or someone that carried more of the burden. But mm -hmm. then there's thousands of other people that have continued um, pu pushing that advancement into the world and making it um, applicable for us. Some a couple more questions. Mm -hmm. um, do you have children? I have one son. One yeah. son. How old's your son? A uh, thirteen. And then, what would be a skill? for your son and other kids that are being born into the world that you think is important for them to know going into the exponential technology age? Critical thinking. I'm worried that kids are now doing so much, uh, but think less. So to me, um, and, and even for my childhood, I had time to, to think. Um, well, it's, it's a problem for kids, but it's also a problem for adults as it well. Is. We're becoming so busy um, and think less. Yes. So I would say critical thinking is something we need to um, emphasize in our education, in our training. Uh, Being spoon-fed media uh, and entertainment rather than uh, enabling ourselves to have long periods of Focus, creativity, free association. Doing nothing. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> because, you know, when you're busy, uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, these yeah. days, if you go to. I have more uh, questions. I have more if questions. If you go to a restaurant, you see people just doing things on the mobile phones and so on. In the past, we probably would just stay there, you know, like this, uh, but somehow probably thinking. A couple last rapid fire questions to ask. What are your thoughts on the meaning of life? I don't know. I've been thinking about that as well. Seriously. So, um, I don't have an answer. But I think it's a question we all have. Yes. Uh, deep in our mind and our heart. So uh, I think sometimes that kind of questions can drive you to some kind of belief because at the end I don't think myself or science can help me to acquire that kind of question, answers to the question. I think so, one of the um, most important things to do is to have more people around the world asking themselves that question. What is the point of life? What is the point of this grand human experience? What is the nature of this reality that we're in? What is the unique gift that I can bring forward into the world? And if we forget to ask that question, forget to ask children to think about those questions. But at the personal level, when you talk problem. about values and so on, of course we all have our value. Uh, but then I don't think that itself uh, will give you the, the answers uh, to the question you just asked. What is life, right? What is the meaning of life? So, um, yeah, I don't have an answer for myself. That's why I think some <laughs> belief, <laughs> religious belief can help with that. I, I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a person um, uh, who's very keen to seek answers to that question. Uh, very, very keen. Like it's, yeah, yeah, totally. So. And um, last three, we got to do these fast because we have, uh, we have to run. What is the role of love in our world? Mm, interesting questions. Now, you know, in, in China, we have a word called yuanfen. Oh, destiny. Now, it's, if I just interpret it, yeah, it could mean that. It's a special relationship. Yeah. So, uh, to me, uh, you can talk about how, uh, you know, at, at one level, of course, uh, let's say between wife and husband, 
um, that love is special, that relationship is special. But love, of course, can be um, uh, broader, much broader than that. But I also think, you know, it's a special relationship. Um, you know, like what you have um, as a special relationship with your work, uh, that's also love. Uh, yes. And of course, even with colleagues, with this university and so on, I'll say that's also love. Yes. Um, in substance, maybe that special relationship carries a lot of, um, uh, you know, common values, common goals, and sheer responsibility to achieve something together. And of course, uh, on the way, great enjoyment shared by both parties or even more parties. Uh, that's what I think what love is or the rule. It's a special relationship with all these uh, ingredients. Uh, yes. Do you think this is a simulation? You mean our... Reality? Reality? Uh... uh I think we we manipulate how to say it. If you use the word simulation, I think that that is kind of meaningful in a way because the reality is what we perceive. Uh, so we already intervene the real reality, if there is one, uh, I would say using simulation is perhaps not a bad word, not completely wrong, put it that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and simulation, I'm trying to relate this almost to my work, I would say it's kind of accurate because when I try to simulate the, the processes, for example, right, they seem to be rules I have applied strictly, but the result, the simulation result, right, could be s subjected to errors, uh, you know, at the very low level, but could be subjected to even the very basis of the models. I'm not trying to challenge those conservation laws, but certainly for a lot of models, we also need to conceptualize how the system may function, what's involved, right? And I'll say our perceptions, our understanding of the reality is a bit like that. It's a modeling process, uh, perhaps with some truth uh, in it, but taking science as an example, right? They are hypothesis, uh, hypotheses tested, but even from the history we know, tested only within constraint of whatever technology at the time, whatever capacity we have, whatever knowledge we have at the time. So I would say simulation is perhaps not a bad word to describe it. Yeah. yeah. And last question is, what do you think is the most beautiful thing in the world? Most beautiful thing? Hmm. I see beauties in a lot of things, but the most beautiful one like I, I even appreciate the beauty of waters and so on in, in different ways. But the most beautiful thing, maybe we can go back to the word love, a special relationship you develop with a lot of things, yes. including the family, of course. Yes. 
so yeah, it could be because you ask for one single beauty and the most, I would say love, but love interpret in you know that very general way. It's a it's a special relationship you have uh, or you develop with you know the family, but also what you do and 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 so on. And the nature, of course. We have a beautiful yeah. relationship with the nature. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you so much Including for maybe coming. this uh, yeah, <laughs> special relationship. Of course, yeah. Absolutely. From the interview, from this, uh, you know, encounters and, and so on. Yeah. yeah. Thank you so much for coming on our show, Ling, and for teaching us about environmental hydrology. It's been thank fascinating. You. Thank you. So enlightening. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below on the episode. Let us know what you're thinking. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online on social media about environmental hydrology, about the relationship between the ocean land interface and interactions, about this idea of groundwater discharge, about the global hydrological cycle in general, the analysis of these return flows, about all of the different things that we talked about, catchment hydrology, about dams, about how to maximize our prosperity on the planet with our environment altogether. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the organizations, the leaders around the world that you believe in. Support them and help them grow. You can support Simulation. Our links are below. Help us continue doing cool things like coming on site to Westlake University and interviewing great people like Ling. And go and build the future, everyone. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much. Thank you for tuning in, and we'll see you soon. Peace. That's a wrap. Good job. <laughs> that was awesome. That was such That's a good. fun. That was such a fun conversation. Okay, same for me.